Good day everybody and we meet yet again. So today I want us to um, kind of look at multiple choice questions uh, in physics. Okay. And the purpose for which I'm doing this video is because I've received quite a number of questions uh, on how to answer multiple choice questions. And, you know, uh, it's one of those sections that I bit uh, problematic because usually it comes at the beginning of your paper right so i want to just show you quickly how to answer certain type of questions and by the way i'm going to well i'm i've just chosen to um answer the ones from the uh, department of basic education that's south african exam okay uh the the 2019 paper so i just want to quickly show you how to answer those questions and uh, so that you may also be able to answer similar questions in future. And by the way, what I'm going to do is uh, perhaps I'm going to also do ones for IEB so that my IEB people also know that uh, I'm still their plug, right? Okay, so um, let's get right into it. Okay, right. So uh, DBE 2019. So let's look at the questions that they have for us there. Okay. So um, they say car is moving at a constant velocity. Now, the thing about multiple choice, you have to pick out, you have to be able to see when they give you certain keywords. Look at this as immediately when they say constant velocity, right? Something should be buzzing. Something should be flashing in your mind and saying, OK, I know constant velocity means that my net force is zero. OK, or first of all, acceleration is zero. Right. It means that my net force is zero. And if you want to extend it, uh, it could also mean that the network done is also zero. Right. Because there's no change in the kinetic energy. Remember, because it's content, constant velocity, it means kinet, kinetic energy before should be equal to kinetic energy after. Or you can say kinetic energy final is the same as kinetic energy initial right so they say which one of the following statements about the uh, forces acting on the car is correct now please be careful of that because sometimes they also say is not correct okay so this time they're looking for the correct statement and in this case let's look at the answer it says the net force acting on the car is zero that looks just about right isn't it it's one of the options that we had okay let's look at the other ones they say there are no net forces uh, uh, acting on the car. That's um, that's not possible. Uh, 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 sorry, there are no forces rather acting on the car. That's not possible because think about it. Uh, even if you were not applying a force, there's still gravitational force and the normal force, right? But what it in fact means is that the net force or the sum of those forces is equal to zero. Okay, uh, the next one says the weight of the car is equal to the normal force acting on the car, right? Um, uh, yes, that may in fact be true, but it may not be true for all, uh, um, uh, you know, conditions. Because think about it, if, we were, it, if it was in an inclined plane, that wouldn't be the case, okay? Uh, or if, uh, you know, if the force... The, uh, with which that uh, you are, um, you are applying on the object is uh, you know at an angle that wouldn't be the case so uh, c wouldn't apply for all situations so and the last one there is there is a non zero net force acting on the car well if there is a non zero uh, net force acting on the car there should be a change in the velocity meaning there should be an acceleration okay so definitely our answer for this question should be a okay right now let's go to the next one i hope you understood that the net force acting on the car is zero okay right let's go to the next one so they say which one of the following statements okay oh sorry i i, I missed uh, the statement before they said um a ball is projected vertically upwards ignore air resistance now immediately they say ignore air resistance what this tells you is that you are simply looking at free fall right meaning that this is motion under the influence of gravitational force only in the case of uh, falling bodies or uh, uh, objects that are moving um, uh, either up and down or up or down 
um, uh, under gravitational force, right? So they say, which one of the following statements about the acceleration of the ball at its maximum height is correct? Now, think about it. So if you had to project something vertically upwards, as it goes up, you know, perhaps it might come down. What you simply know is that at any given point, okay, of this object, wherever it might be, whether it was on its way up or on its way coming down, remember that gravitational force will always act in the same direction. And what is that direction? That direction will always be downwards. Now, we know that at a maximum height, the velocity of the object is zero, right? The velocity is zero. However, the acceleration still remains 9.8 meters per second squared downwards. Okay, so please, I want you to note in this case, it doesn't matter whether it is moving up or down. Gravitational acceleration is uh, 9.8 meters per second squared downwards. Okay, right. Now they say the acceleration is equal to, okay, so it's G, right? And is directed downwards. So my answer would be B, right? Uh, remember, uh, acceleration cannot be zero for a object under free fall. Uh, G is directed upwards, never, because then it would mean that this object would actually move uh, up and up and never come back down, okay? Right? Uh, gravitational acceleration never changes direction. The object may change direction, but gravity doesn't, okay? Please keep that in mind because um, it's one of the general misconceptions uh, when it comes to uh, the area of uh, projectile motion, okay? So the answer there should be G, uh, G and is directed downwards, okay? Right, let's have a look at the next question, okay? Uh, see, now I kind of soiled this part now. Okay, right. I, I, I kind of love these questions um, that have to do with, uh, you know, uh, Newton's law of gravitation, right? They say the graph below, uh, not drawn to scale, shows the relationship between, okay, uh, let me just pull that down so that you can see that part. Okay, they say the um, graph below, not drawn to scale, shows the relationship between the gravitational force on a given mass okay and its distance from the center of the earth okay right please note there they say the magnitude of the force on the uh, mass at a distance r from the center of uh, the earth is f now i want you to please note what they are saying here they they've given you a graph okay Right, I'm, I'm just going to write uh, my notes on the side here so that you can see that. They've given you a graph, okay? And they are showing you that the force is F, okay? Uh, they say the magnitude of the force um, on the mass at a distance R from the center of the Earth is, is, is force F. So what this simply means, remember when you look at Newton's laws... Uh, of universal gravitation it says f is equals to g now let's take the mass of the earth for argument's sake and the mass of the object so in this case it means that r would represent the radius of the earth right okay so that's what they said it's, they said it's from the center of the earth so it means that this would be r but remember it is not just r but r squared now, they ask us a question. Which one of the following is the correct representation of the magnitude of X, okay, shown on the graph? Now, look at the graph. Um, where R is concerned, the force there is F. Can you see that? So, where R is concerned, there's the force, the magnitude of the force. It's F there, okay? And you'll see when we've got 2R, the force is a quarter of F, but I'll show you how you get to that, right? Now, obviously, let's say you want to find out what is the force when the distance, when the radius or when the, yeah, when the distance from the center of the Earth is actually twice the radius of the Earth, 
right? So what you'll simply do, remember that universal gravitational constant remains the same, the mass of the Earth remains the same, the mass of the object remains the same. However, now what has changed is the distance. The distance would be 2r, isn't it? Okay, so if I say 2r squared, look at this. So what now happens is that, um, so let's just play around with the maths a, a bit. Okay, so I have GME, the mass of the earth, mass of the object, divided by 4R squared. So, if I try to represent this in a way, in fact, let me call this F1 or, you know, whatever you want to call it, okay? Uh, let's call it F1, okay? So, in this case, uh, because it can't be F, F already represents the... Uh, the force when something is at the surface of the earth okay so whatever that object was it was sitting at the center of the earth but in this case i want okay so if that's the distance r let's say this object would be sitting here at a distance which is r and another r so it is two r distances away from the center of the earth right so um in this case now have a look at this so I'll say, well, I want to get rid of this 4 at the bottom here. So what do I do? I just simply multiply by the inverse of it, uh, multiply by 1 over 4. But remember what I do at the bottom, I need to do at the top, okay, so that nothing changes. A quarter divided by a quarter will give me 1, so it means I've changed nothing. But in this case, the reason I want to do that is so that I can cancel those out, okay? So now what do I have at the top? I'll have 1 over 4, that's G, M, E, multiplied by M, the mass of the earth, the mass of the object, divided by, now remember, I've cancelled that out, now I've le I'm, I'm left with uh, R squared. But remember, what did this represent? Okay, this represented F, isn't it? Okay, so this represented force F. So it means that my force F1, okay, will now be equal to 1 over 4 F. Okay, and that's how they were able to get that 1 over 4 F there. Now, the same thinking would be true when it comes to a distance of 6R, which is what they are actually looking for. Okay, I, I really hope you can still follow in what I'm doing. Okay, um, so uh, the same would be true at a distance of 6R. And I want to just quickly show you, let's call that F2 there. Okay, so if I call it F2, it means it's the same object. So gravitational, uh, um, uh, universal gravitational, uh, uh, you know, constant stays the same. Mass of the Earth is the same, mass of the object is the same, but now the distance is 6 radii away from the Earth, right? So in this case, our distance is 6r, okay? But remember that distance is squared. Now let's simplify this. So it means that now we've got g, m, e once again, m divided by... This is going to be 36 R squared. Now, once again, how do I get rid of this 36? Okay, so simply multiply by 1 over 36. But what you do at the bottom, you do at the top. Okay, so that this cancels out. Okay, right. And uh, what do you ultimately have? Okay, I'm just going to move this a little bit. Okay, so that um, you can see it as I calculate. Uh, so... What do I ultimately have? I will have, um, uh, so this is going to simply be, so F2 will be 1 over 36 times, remember now, what does this all represents? GME times E multiply, uh, divide by R squared. Remember, we called it F, okay? So they wanted an answer in relation to FNS. And sorry about that, uh, because I wrote onto this thing. Okay, so uh, the answers that we have there is A6F, uh, 12F, 1 over 6F, and the last one, uh, 1 over 36F. So the correct answer there should be our answer D.
uh, which is that one over there. Okay, right. Now let's continue quickly. Okay, so I hope you, you really understood that one. Uh, I've, I, I usually get a lot of questions around that one. Okay, now they say ball M moving at a speed of V to the right collides with a stationary ball N. Okay, so uh, let's try to um, illustrate that. So here's ball M. Okay, they said to us uh, ball M is moving to the um, moving at a speed of V. So M is moving at a speed of V to the right. Okay, so there's speed V to the right, and it collides with another with a stationary ball N. Okay, they say on a smooth horizontal surface. Now, please note the moment they say to us on a smooth horizontal surface, it means that there is no frictional force, right? And the moment there's no frictional force, uh, it simply tells me that momentum is conserved. There are no external forces. And remember the condition for uh, uh, conservation of momentum, okay, is that it must be in an isolated system, meaning there must be no external forces. Now, they say it collides with the stationary ball N on a smooth surface. Immediately after collision, ball M comes to, uh, comes to rest and ball N moves to the right at speed V. So, which means immediately after collision, here it is. So they collide with one another. This one was stationary and this one was moving at, uh, uh, um, at V. Okay. Now, after collision, what happens is that ball M now is stationary. So this one is now stationary at uh, v met uh, 0 meters per second. But this one now moves at the speed V, which is the original speed of that one. Now, for that to be true, it would mean that uh, when I look at this, remember the momentum before collision has to be equal to the momentum after the collision, right? Now, suppose we say the mass of ball M is... Um, in fact, let's let's do exactly that. So some of their momenta before collision. So that's going to be the mass of M, okay, multiplied by V. And the one after collision, it's going to be the mass of ball M, uh, ball N rather. Uh, and by the way, remember, it means that the momentum of ball N is zero. Why? Because the speed is zero, okay? And then here it's going to be the momentum of ball N, okay, because the momentum of ball N is zero, okay, so it means that it's going to be mass of N multiplied by the same speed, which is V, okay, all right, uh, plus zero, okay, just to show you that the momentum of M is zero. Now, we know that the conservation of linear momentum says these two must be equal, right? Now, for that to be the case, for these two to be the uh, to to be equal, it can only mean that the mass of M must therefore be equal to the mass of N. But let's see which questions are they asking us. They say which one of the following statements about the collision of the balls is correct. Remember, we're looking for the correct information. They say total momentum. Uh, is conserved and the masses of the balls are unequal. Ah, uh, nope. So we know that it should be, the, the, the mass of the two balls should be equal. They say total kinetic energy is conserved, right? And the mass of the uh, balls are unequal. So that's not an option uh, either. So that's D. Okay. And then C says total momentum and total kinetic energy are conserved, all right, and the masses of the balls are equal. I would accept uh, a C because think about it, their mass would be the same, velocity should be the same, so therefore kinetic energy should also be the same, all right, uh, assuming that they are at the same height, obviously. Um, so in that case, it would mean that uh, the total kinetic energy should remain conserved, right? And let's see if uh, uh, D, uh, you know, says anything that we like or don't like. They say total momentum is conserved, 
but total kinetic energy is not conserved and the masses of the balls are equal okay uh, i would tend to go with uh with d all right uh, because of the condition that I've just stated here, uh, that um, it must be that the balls uh, were uh, had equal masses. So if you look at, if you try to calculate the kinetic energy before and kinetic energy afterwards, it should uh, be the same. Okay, so I would actually take C as a final answer. Now, quickly, let's continue. Right, I was hoping this would be very short. Okay, um, so let's try to zoom in there. Right, so they uh, in 1.5, they say a stone is dropped from rest and goes to, uh, from rest and undergoes free fall, right? They say which one of the graphs below shows the correct relationship between the gravitational potential energy, okay, and the speed um, V and the kinetic energy, and speed v uh, respectively sorry for the stone right they say the graphs are not drawn to scale okay now let me show you this one quickly okay let me try to uh, just make some uh, create some space for us a little bit okay okay so uh continuing there so it, it you know it would be it wouldn't be as easy to uh, relate potential energy with velocity. However, with kinetic energy, it's quite simple, right? Uh, we would say, okay, so kinetic energy is equal to half mv squared. Now, if you think about it mathematically, half is constant, mass is constant, assuming it's the same object, right? So this is a constant multiplied by V squared. So if you were to plot a graph of kinetic energy versus uh, velocity, this would be the same as saying Y is equals to AX squared, isn't it? What type of a graph is this? Definitely a parabola, okay? So if you were to draw a graph of kinetic energy versus the velocity, and note it's not the velocity squared, but it is the velocity. So in that case, it would be a parabolic function, okay? So we know that um, basically kinetic energy would form a parabola. So um, let's see by elimination. So in this case, um, all right, A could be an option. We'll look into it. But definitely that's it, that, that, that eliminates uh, uh, graph B, right? because it shows that kinetic energy against velocity is kind of a linear uh, function, okay? Whereas, um, okay, C could also be an option, all right? Because kinetic energy is that parabola over there. And then um, D could also be a, 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 a possibility, okay? But let's see. So between the three, which one would I pick? So I've shown you why not to pick D, uh, uh, B, right? But remember, ladies and gents, when I when something is in free fall, as the gravitational potential energy decreases, remember the height is decreasing, but as it gains kinetic energy, meaning as it goes faster and faster, it's losing potential energy at the same rate, okay? So the rate of increase in potential in kinetic energy is almost the same as the rate of um, uh, yeah the same of the, the the rate of increase rather in kinetic energy is equal to the rate of decrease okay uh, of potential energy. So when I look at those graphs there, definitely D is out because it's saying well, potential energy is decreasing linearly. Now, I'm left with these two graphs, okay? And le let's see, which graph would I pick? I would, go with, um, uh, I would go with graph C. And the reason for that is that, look at this, when the kinetic energy, so this would be at, 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 at its maximum height where it starts, right? Uh, so if it starts from rest, so I know that the kinetic energy would be zero. 
and the potential energy would be maximum isn't it but as this one increases at, uh, as a parabola all right this one is also a parabola that is that is decreasing can you see so it's telling me this guy is actually going down 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 and at a point uh, my potential energy is going to reach zero okay uh, when the kinetic energy is maximum so i would tend to go with uh, d uh, with c okay um um you know when i look at that one i see that yes uh, the kinetic energy is, uh, it, it looks okay but if you think about it okay uh when i look at that potential energy there right um that looks like a shifted parabola you know a parabola that would be uh would have its turning point around there um in that case i would tend to you know uh, uh, shy away from this guy okay uh, because again the rate of increase is not the same as the rate of decrease uh, of this um of this graph okay so i hope that kind of makes sense all right uh, moving right along okay let me show you quickly how to answer 1.6 we're moving very swiftly. I was hoping that we'll be able to do this in record time. Okay. Um, and they say a, a stationary passenger at a railway station listens to a train approaching at a constant speed. Okay. Now note in this case, listens and the train is approaching. So already I'm expecting something that whatever the person hears okay should be or rather in this case the frequency of the listener should be greater than the frequency of the source okay all right um so or, or you can even talk about the pitch in this case now they say which one of the following is correct for the sound of the approaching train heard by the stationary passenger okay all right so um so definitely it means that the frequency would be higher so i would uh, a and b would not be uh, um, uh, would not be options in this case so let me look at c and d uh, since it talks about higher frequency remember higher frequency uh, pitch and frequency are related right um so in this case I would say uh, the answer should be C because it talks about higher pitch as well as higher frequency. All right. So this is a good way of uh, revising as we are preparing for those uh, prelims or for those uh, final exams. Right. All right. Quickly, let's look at 1.7. Okay. They say a particle P has a charge of Q and particle r has a charge of 2q uh, they are separated by a small distance r okay so which means that we've got two particles all right that are separated from each other however they are exerting forces on one another right so now um okay so they told us that this one has a charge of q and this one is a charge of 2q right so this is uh, p and particle r has a charge of 2q right so uh, they say which one of the statements below about the electrostatic force fpr now meaning the force that p exerts on r okay um and frp so if you look at this as FPR, all right, and this one as force RP, and it didn't matter whether it is a force of attraction or force of repulsion, uh, that's besides the point. They said that the distance between them uh, is a distance R, right? Now, they want to know... Um, so which one uh, pertaining to these two forces is actually uh, correct now what i want you to note ladies and gents this is a classic um you know 
interpretation of Newton's third law. Because Newton's third law says if body A exerts a force on body B, then body B will exert an equal but opposite force on body A, right? So if you look at this, well, I, there's no A and B here, but there's P and R. So it means that regardless of the size of their charge, right, the force that P exerts on R should be equal and opposite to the force that R exerts on P. Why? Because of Newton's third law. It didn't matter even if you have a truck and a, uh, you know, and a, a, a Mini Cooper, you know, colliding with one another, right? With the moment they collide, the moment they crash into each other, the force that the one exerts on the other is equal to the force that well the force that the truck exerts on the on the on the car uh, should be the same uh, equal and opposite to the force that the car exerts on the truck okay yeah i'm sure someone is thinking to themselves no way say no that's no way there's no way that that can be true no 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 you are thinking about acceleration in that case right Yes, the car will be affected more. Why? Because it has a smaller mass. However, the forces that they exert to one to another should be exactly the same. Okay? So, um, I believe the correct answer there uh, should, be, uh, should be D. Okay? So, FPR should be equal and opposite to minus FRP. I hope that makes sense to you, ladies and gents. Right, so let's move on to the next one. Um, so the next one says a battery. So we've got a circuit there. They say battery of EMF, E, and negligible internal resistance. So meaning that uh, there's no internal resistance in this case. It's connected in a circuit as shown below. The resistance R1 and R2 are high. Right. OK, so uh, they say which one of the following combinations about the emitter reading will be correct when the switch is open. OK, so that's the first one. And when the switch S is closed, that's for the second option. OK, now, um, so let's just look at it. Uh, first of all, let's just analyze. So let's look at this first scenario when the switch is open. So when the switch is open, please, I want you to note, ladies and gents, when that switch is open, it means that the current, now please note, don't say there won't be current moving, because look at it, when that switch is open, it means there won't be current, yes, flowing across the switch. So what will happen is that there'll be current, all the current will move across R1, and all the current will move across R2. Can you see that? Okay. So there won't be current moving across the switch. So all the current moves across R1 as well as uh, R2. Okay. Right. So um, let's look at our options there. They say emitter reads only the current on R1. That's not true. Uh, emitter reads only the current in R2. Okay. Uh, that's not true either. So um, the emitter reads the current in both R1 and R2. Okay, that looks just about right. So our options are between C and D. But now what will determine that is when the switch is closed. So what happens when the switch is closed? The moment we close that switch, okay, what begins to happen. Now, please, I want you to listen to this carefully. If you remember in my previous videos, right, when I went through circuits with switches, I said a switch, a closed switch has got zero, uh, uh, zero resistance, meaning that the moment I connect these two together, uh, uh, the, the moment I connect that switch, now the current, all of it says, okay, but why should I bother going through a path with a resistance when I can just simply take a path that does not uh, have a resistance. So essentially, the, the switch there, when it's closed, short circuits R1. So it means R1 is as good as non-existent. 
okay yeah you may ask me oh but how is that possible remember that current goes where there is less resistance more current goes where there is less resistance now the moment i close that there's zero resistance here the current says oh my oh my i'll go all the way okay uh, i'll make sure that all the current passes through where there's no resistance so in actual fact what it means is that only r2 is operational okay r1 is bypassed there okay short circuited so in this case it means that only current in r2 so let's look at, the, at those options there so in c remember our options were between c and d so it means that um they say let's look uh emitter reads between both r1 and r2 so definitely not c and uh, d says emitter reads the current in r2 only that is absolutely correct so in that case, I would take the answer for uh, for D in 1.8. Okay, right. Quickly, uh, we are making progress very quickly. So the direction, okay, that's 1.9. The direction of the induced current in the coil of a generator depends on, okay. Now, you remember that current, okay, when whenever you induce current, the direction of the current depends on several factors, right? Uh, in this case, um, we know that, okay, we know that this is going to be a change in magnetic flux divided by, okay, so it's the rate of change in magnetic flux. So the things that will um, determine the direction of the current are your magnets, first of all. Um, so how i place my magnets my north and south okay if i switch north this side and put south this side that will definitely affect um, the direction okay and then secondly um okay uh, what will uh, uh, you know affect the the direction of the current also is the direction of rotation whether i'm rotating clockwise or anti-clockwise that should have a bearing on the amount or, or rather on the on the current okay right so uh, in fact i shouldn't even have mentioned this because this has to do with um, you know the amount of current or the induced emf right so let's look at the options that were given okay they say the direction remember they are not looking at the magnitude they look at the current okay the the direction of the current length of coil never the speed of rotation never direction of the magnetic field okay now that makes sense why because remember uh, uh, magnetic field always moves from uh, north to south so the moment that i change the position of my magnets or you know swap the polarity in that case it affects the magnetic field so as a result c should be the correct answer okay swiftly let's look at the last question there okay they say the work function is greater than um is greater than that of magnesium okay which one of the statements about the threshold frequency of the metal is correct okay right now ladies and gents just to remind ourselves you know multiple choice is a very good way of uh, reminding ourselves of things right okay um so they are telling us that the work function of zinc is greater than the work function of magnesium okay so what does that mean it means that you would require a greater amount of energy all right to emit electrons in zinc than you would in magnesium okay so uh, they say which one of the following statements about the threshold frequencies of the metal is correct okay let's look at a they say the threshold frequency of zinc is greater than that of magnesium all right yeah that would make sense because remember work function is related to the threshold frequency what does that mean the greater the threshold frequency the greater the work function so in this case they told us that the work function of zinc 
is greater so it means that its threshold frequency should also be greater okay uh, so a looks about correct okay let's look at why the other ones were not uh, were, were not the correct ones they say the threshold frequency of zinc is smaller than that of magnesium okay this one wouldn't make sense um, because if it's smaller then it would mean that the work function should also be smaller and that's not what they said there they say both zinc and magnesium have the same threshold frequency obviously impossible okay so that's a non uh, uh, answer there okay so they say the threshold frequency of zinc and magnesium are independent of their work function of course that is not true because work function does actually affect the work function uh, at th i mean uh, threshold frequency does affect work function okay so ladies and gents um just as a final uh, uh, comment on the uh, on multiple choice sections I want you to please note that multiple choice sections are, you know, they can be tricky. So I usually say, you know, just um, make sure that you don't spend an unnecessary amount of time trying to answer a multiple choice. Remember, uh, you are usually given, um, you know, it's 10 questions, it's 20 marks, right? So that means that you ought to be able to answer it, you know, uh, relatively speaking, um, you know within 24 minutes okay i'll show you how to actually calculate time uh, for your exam um so don't spend an unnecessary amount of time in it you know uh, if you see that multiple choice is a bit of a an issue at the beginning because it might actually affect your confidence you know so if you find that the first two three questions are giving you a, a bit of an issue just go and start with the long questions and then only tackle multiple choice questions afterwards okay right so uh, as we prepare i hope that you still will continue uh, to do the right thing okay for those of you who have not subscribed please do the right thing okay and um, uh, if you really liked this video uh, just give it a thumbs up as well and i'll see you guys next time shop shop